Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets, and welcome to the January 22nd, 2018 edition of our weekly top three, our 15-minute-ish weekly podcast that focuses on the top three issues that we're following as we move from the week before to the week ahead. For additional updates and thoughts during the week, you can join us at our Facebook page, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. This week, our top three issues are first, to go back to some first principles on the permanent fund dividend, a, a foundation point, a starting point for a lot of discussions that we've been having both last week and we anticipate in the weeks ahead. Second, a look at the FY 2019 budget, particularly focusing on the revenue piece of it in our view, the starting point for any budget before you even get to costs. Costs need to fit within revenues, and you need to start with revenues. And the third is our weekly look at oil. Uh, in this case, what's happening with price, uh, and a little bit about uh, the what's going on up in Prudhoe Bay. First, let's start with some first principles about the permanent fund dividend that I think are important for Alaskans to consider as we as we move into the coming session. In the lower 48, mineral resources, oil resources, are owned largely by private individuals. And oil companies contract with those private individuals through leases in order to develop uh, and produce oil from those grounds. When they do, the royalty from that production, the royalty payments, the payments due under the lease for uh, the right to produce uh, and, ta and take ownership to the oil and gas are paid to the private mineral owners. They're paid to the private parties that, that own the mineral interests. And that, that ownership, that revenue stream has played a significant part, if you look back on it, has played a significant part in the development of the private sectors in Oklahoma, in Louisiana, in Texas, uh, New Mexico, all of, the, all of the historic major oil producing states and continues to play a, an important role today in those same states, plus North Dakota, which has benefited from shale production. And if you look at West Virginia, Ohio, Pennsylvania, states that have benefited from significant shale, shale gas uh, production. Mineral owners, estate owners in those states have benefited significantly. They've taken that wealth that they've accumulated and they've spent it in the in the private sector, bolstering the private sector uh, economies of those states. Alaska is different. Under the Statehood Act, the federal government provided that, that it would transfer mineral interests that it owned in lands ultimately selected by the state to the state. The Statehood Act also provided that the state couldn't further transfer those lands, unlike what happened, unlike what the, the rules are in the lower 48, the state couldn't further transfer the mineral interest to those lands to private parties. Uh, they had to remain, under the Statehood Act, they had to remain in the hands of the, of the state. In fact, the, the, the Statehood Act provides that in the, in the event the state ever tried to transfer ownership of the mineral interest to private parties, that the, the, the mineral interest would revert instead to the federal government instead of being permitted to be transferred to private parties. That created at statehood then uh, a, 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 an economy, a state on economy much different from what exists in the lower 48, the oil producing states in the lower 48. It created a state economy that was, that was much more government centered in Alaska than what you would ever find in Texas, Oklahoma, or the other producing states because under the Statehood Act, those, rev those interests were transferred to the state um, and, and the state couldn't, couldn't further transfer those interests to, to private hands. Once oil got flowing at Prudhoe, however, Governor Hammond and those who had established the permanent fund in 1976 developed a mechanism that frankly I think is genius as a way of trying to create some replication of the private sector economy in Alaska that existed in Texas, Oklahoma, uh, and the other producing states. And that is, they provided, uh, according to Governor Hammond's description, that each year one half of the earnings from the permanent fund would be dispersed among Alaska residents, go directly into the hands of the private sector 
through, through Alaska residents. And the other half of the earnings could be used for essential government services. Now, that's still different from what occurs in the lower 48, because recall that in the lower 48, all of the mineral royalties go into the hands of the, of the private sector uh, owners and go through their hands into each state's or, or a broader uh, economy as it's spent by those private sector owners. In Alaska, only half of the earnings from off of the royalties, off of the invested royalties, are going into the hands of private citizens. But still, that's better than where we were before. You're still getting half of the earnings going directly into the private sector through the hands of citizens, in some way replicating what's going on in the other uh, lower 48 uh, states. That approach has had a very positive impact on the overall Alaska economy. In fact, in, in 2016, uh, ICER, in an analysis of the various fiscal options that the state could use to deal with the, with the emerging uh, fiscal crisis that we had then and still have today, concluded that cutting the PFD, cutting that 50% established by Governor Hammond and currently in the statute, cutting the PFD would have the largest adverse impact on the economy of any of the so-called new revenue options. Largest adverse impact. In another study in 2016, ICER also found that, quote, a cut in PFDs would be f by far the costliest measure for Alaska families, close quote, close quote, of all of the new revenue options. So there's a genius in what Governor Hammond and the statute does in terms of transferring money into the private, putting money into the private sector in a way that replicates what's going on to the lower 48 states, the successful, lower, the successful private sector economies of the lower 48 oil states. There's a genius in what Governor Hammond's done, and there's a significant danger in what our current govern, government is now talking about doing, our current governor, our current Senate, and indeed even our current House, is talking about doing in terms of cutting the PFD uh, now that we've gotten to the fiscal, pri fiscal crisis, taking that money out of the private sector economy as established by the PFD, consistent with what goes on in the lower 48 states, and transferring that money in, in essentially, essentially a de facto tax of that money back into the state treasury by withholding it uh, from distribution in the way envisioned by Governor Hammond. Those, that first principle, I think, is important, is important to understand as we will go into the discussions of the coming weeks about whether the legislature should permanently cut the PFD. But every time we get into those discussions, I hope that you and others will think about those first principles. What were we originally trying to accomplish with the PFD? What have we accomplished? What has been the success of the PFD? It's been substantial. And what is the cost that we're, that we're creating for the Alaska economy uh, by changing that approach now? The second thing we're watching this week are some dis discussions that are getting underway about the amount of permanent fund earnings that government should look to or the permanent fund should be directed to distribute to the general fund each year in order to help fund government. This is separate and apart. This is a discussion really separate and apart from whether the percentage ought to be 50 percent or should be uh, uh, 75% as the Senate has proposed or 67% as the House has proposed. It is the question about how do you calculate what the size of the pot is that then is uh, used in the calculation of the percentage distribution between the PFD and the state. The issues involved in that discussion are tremendously important and certainly are things that we'll be talking about and writing about uh, in, the, in the weeks ahead. But what I think is important now is that we have that discussion now at the, beginning of the at the beginning of the session as we're talking about what revenues uh, uh, we're going to have to deal with the budget this session. There's been a lot of talk about pushing the education spending budget up in time. There's been a lot of talk about getting the operating budget and the capital budget uh, out uh, early this session. But those put the cart before the horse. You need to know what your revenue pot is before you decide what your spending is and how you prioritize the money uh, that you have to spend uh, uh, in, 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 toward the latter part of the session. Uh, 
Revenues need to come before spending. That's been a problem, frankly, that we've had since 2014 when we when we slid into this economic crisis. We've never focused on what re what the revenue should be before we've gotten into spending. We've always just totaled up spending and said, "Here's the spending number." Uh, yes, we know re it's not going to. We know revenues are going to be short, but we haven't really figured out what we want on revenues. We're just going to total up the spending number and say this is the right number. This session, hopefully, we do it better. We focus on revenues, like the questions that were that are starting to be raised about the permanent fund earnings stream, what should be the size of that, and then how should it be divided between the PFD and the general fund. Those questions need to be taken up early and they be, need to be resolved, frankly, before we, before we turn to the spending numbers. We'll be talking more about, about how do you determine that revenue number in the weeks ahead, uh, in both writing and on here. Frankly, we're not that opposed to a POMV approach We've got to deal with inflation proofing in some fashion. POMV is frankly just another way of deal, dealing with infl inflation proofing, probably a slightly better way of doing it, uh, maybe, even a, maybe even a more than slightly better way of doing it than how we've done it in the past, um, something that we think is appropriate to discuss. But we've got to have those discussions now uh, before we start setting uh, spending levels, before we start uh, uh, moving up budgets and saying we're going to set education spending ahead of even before we know what the revenues are. We've got to have those discussions about revenues first. The third issue we're following this week, as we always do uh, every week, are issues uh, relating to oil uh, and natural gas. Uh, let's start with price this week. Uh, as, we're, as we're recording this podcast today, the price is, uh, the global price, Brent cry. Brent price is around $69. The Alaska price generally follows uh, the Brent price because it trades uh, essentially on the same markets as Brent does. Um, so we're around $69 down from uh, numbers that begin with seven, down from 70, uh, but not that far down. And when you look at the future strip, uh, that is the forward trading in the months ahead, uh, April is 68, uh, May. June are both 68, 67s. Uh, by the time you get to January 19, uh, you're at 65. So we're still in backwardation. We're still in a period where the futures prices are trading lower than the current price, which means that market participants an anticipate or believe the current price is being driven by tran transitory events, events that are occurring now, dealing uh, or in the short term, dealing with price in the short term, but not having a lasting and a significantly lasting effect, um, uh, and so uh, prices are coming down. We continue to, um, these prices, though, continue to be above the levels predicted uh, and used for the revenue forecast that, that underlies the governor's budget. So we think one of the things that the legislature needs to look into is oil price and certainly production levels. Um, uh, as they as they set uh, this year's budget, not only for this year, but looking forward out into the future uh, uh, over the next five to ten years. Uh, so you can determine what a sustainable level is, sustainable budget level is, as opposed to sort of gliding up and down based upon what's going on in the year. Uh, it looks like the prices support uh, a higher revenue level than the governor's forecast, uh, but that's something the legislature needs to dig into. The other thing in the in the oil uh, patch this week, there's an excellent article um, uh, over the weekend in the Anchorage Daily News by Alex DeBarbin that talks about uh, BP's efforts and the fruits of those efforts to stabilize oil production in the Prudhoe field. Uh, BP has made huge strides in in stabilizing production from the field. That production was on a five to six percent annual decline had been for for a, a long period of time, uh, which resulted, which was driving a significant part of the overall Alaska, Alaska production decline. Uh, this year, uh, the article reports on the fact that BP has not only stabilized production, it's increased it uh, slightly uh, above expectations. Um, and and really, as, as Janet Weiss, the head of BP Alaska, is quoted as saying, uh, by holding things flat, it's like we're, we find, we're finding a new field every year. By offsetting uh, uh, 
what otherwise would be a decline in Alaska's largest field. It's like we're adding additional production. Uh, and in fact, uh, 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 that's been something that, that BP has striven for, and I think uh, the results are showing this year. Well, that wraps it up for this week's weekly top three. Thank you for joining us uh, at uh, for the January 22nd, 2018 version of the weekly top three. Please join us every Monday uh, as we post uh, these podcasts of what we see uh, from the past week going into the week ahead uh, from the perspective of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. And please join, in, uh, join us during the week at our Facebook page, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets, as we discuss these and other issues that arise uh, during the week that we think have significance to uh, Alaska's fiscal and economic situation. This is Brad Keithley thanking you again.